Welcome to the Boosting Business Breakthroughs podcast, where coaches gain the confidence, motivation, and expertise to make their next business breakthrough. I am your host, Lori Young, certified master marketer, business growth coach, and all around truth teller. Breakthroughs can come with flashes of absolute clarity, sudden shifts in mindset, learning new skills, changes in habits, or anything else that changes the course of your coaching business. So if you're ready to be inspired and break through to your next level of growth, let's go. Welcome to episode four. Today, we are going to be talking about one of the best ways to land new coaching clients, and that is through public speaking. Now, public speaking has changed a lot uh, since the pandemic. We used to, you know, public speaking, we used to think about that as being on stage and speaking in front of a large group. Today, it's different. Although that is happening, public speaking can be speaking in Zoom meetings. It can be guest appearances on podcasts. I think it can even be getting behind a camera and doing video. There is so much that we can do with our public speaking voice to land coaching clients. But if you're like a lot of people, you might be cringing at the idea of public speaking and it might make you want to kind of run and hide. And if that's the case for you, I have the perfect guest. We are going to be talking about public speaking today and how you can transform your relationship with the public speaking experience. Um, SJ is great. I'm going to formally introduce uh, her so that we can get started. So SJ Harrison is a voice and performance coach for public speaking using holistic techniques to help you speak with confidence and ease. She's an award winning actor and playwright in three different countries. SJ specializes, but is not limited to working with third culture people. So SJ, why don't you just introduce yourself a little bit more? That's the formal introduction. Tell us kind of a little bit about your business and how you got to where you are today. Thank you, Lori. It's such a pleasure to be here. My business has gone through so many changes in the sense that the formal I am a voice and performance coach for public speaking aspect really started during the pandemic, although I have over 15 years experience actually coaching people in voice and performance. And so many of those people were really acting students and clients before the pandemic. So during the pandemic, I like many people, began to wonder, could I teach online? And I say this because certainly all the people I know involved in performance for sort of stage would always say, I can't teach online. You know, there was this push, particularly for universities, one of the universities I was teaching at, to just get everything online. And because performance is so much about connection, and it still is, whether you're online or not, it's about how do you make that connection, in this case, perhaps through the screen, we felt like that's just not possible. That's, that's totally taking away what live engagement is all about. But the pandemic came, and in fact, it made me, in a way, I think like many people, there are quite a lot of us out there who just took a different turn because of it. And so I decided that I would figure out how I could do it online. Mm -hmm. And so for the last two and a bit years, Mm -hmm. most of my clients have been online, although that's transitioning. Now I have many more local people and that I'm really enjoying as well. So that was the sort of structure of it. Personally, I had found it in my own life very important to bring forth my voice. So as an actor, I had a trained voice and I knew how to do this in performance on a stage with a character. Mm -hmm. But being oneself in public is actually a lot harder. And part of that is to do with most people are not trained to do it. Mm -hmm. And whereas as an actor, I have years of training and experience getting up in front of an audience and I have all these tools at my disposal. So most people don't have that. And most people, something like 75% are extremely anxious with public speaking. It's a normal reaction because we are 
it, it, there's a contradiction here. We want to connect. That's actually usually what we're trying to do in front of a group of people. So we want connection. They want connection. They certainly want to feel good in that moment and enjoy what you're saying or learn or whatever the goal is. But we're also standing out in front of our tribe. We're also right. setting ourselves apart, which primarily has always meant possibly death. So just to really <laughs> emphasize why yes. we're afraid. We're afraid mm -hmm. because we're setting ourselves apart and, and we're there and sort of metaphorically, we're there to have tomatoes thrown at us potentially. Right. <laughs> and be exiled. So, so just to really put it into perspective. And so techniques are the thing that will really help you overcome that. A lot of it is about just knowing what to do and trying it out and trying it out again and building your skill set. And that includes mind, body, and emotion. And it includes, and I'll talk about this more later, really developing your own personal style. So that's what I aim to help people do. Not a cookie cutter of this is a power stance or mm -hmm. this is how you move. This is how you're supposed to um, engage people in a very uh, scripted way almost. Partly that leaves out culture and context entirely. And so mm -hmm. we all know different cultures have different ways of expressing themselves and also one thing that's polite in one culture is rude in another just to take it out further so we all need to develop a style that works for us and our audience and that yeah. can sometimes be a compromise yeah i can i can so relate to what you're talking about just like comparing public speaking to like death I remember back in 2004 when I first started my coaching business. Today I'm running a digital marketing agency, but I did run a coaching business for eight years. And one of the first things that I did to go out and try and find clients was start public speaking. And I remember I scheduled a workshop at like a little local, I think it was like a little local gym. And I literally had four people show up for this workshop. And I'm telling you, you would think, oh, it's just four people, right? You're, it's not, not a big deal. I was deathly afraid. I mean, shaking inside. Mm -hmm. I had like actual physical reactions to mm -hmm. getting in front of those four people, like four, and actually speaking and giving my presentation. And I'm, I can tell you just from experience that that fear continued for quite a while, even though I pushed myself to get out there and speak every time, whether it was 10 people, 20 people, it was just scary. I mean, eventually I overcame that. And I think mm -hmm. I overcame that through just practice, but boy, it, it is really scary because like you said, it's like, People are judging you. You're standing up in front of the whole world or in up front of your whole audience and all eyes are on you and you know that you're being judged. You know that people are thinking things and yeah, it's, it's a tough thing. So I'm so glad that you are here because I know that everything that you're going to share is going to be so helpful for people that, that feel that way. So tell me just a little bit about your superpower. Like I like to know kind of what makes you different uh, in the business world. I think it has to do with deep listening mm -hmm. and really honing in on each person individually. So that's something I bring to every aspect of my life. I really investigate who is this person and what are their challenges? And then what is their context? What is their language um, context? What is their ethnic context? How are they feeling in their environment? So I'm really looking at the big picture. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people may not, uh, I have a very, well, just kind of a personal background in having had a very multicultural life. And by, by that, I simply mean I'm often maybe the only person like me in, in a community, 
different spaces that I inhabit or, or we're all like that. We're all from different places. Mm -hmm. I grew up with people from different backgrounds. I married someone from a different culture and ethnicity and then, and had children. So my world is very global in terms of how I see things. Mm -hmm. So for me, there isn't such a set norm as say someone who tends to generally spend more time within, um, their own, culture of origin. Sure, sure. So it's more of a perspective. I, I think I mm -hmm. have a bird's eye and then I really want to go in just to that person. Got it. Um, so obviously I might be coaching several people from India, but I'm not going to just assume that's a very big country for a start with many languages. I'm not going to assume, well, they're all, you know, all Indians have this problem either, right? I'm going right. to take in the culture, but I'm going to take in the person. Got so, it. Um, I, I think that's it. I think that's yeah. it. Not really, yeah. really seeing on the large and on the, on the small. And on the small. Yeah, that's, that's really important. And I think just the whole listening piece and, and being able to deeply listen to your client, um, I'm sure that that can even translate into kind of like feeling an audience and being kind of in tune with, uh, an audience like during public speaking. Yes, it, it does. You're, if you're relaxed enough, you're mm -hmm. able to suddenly connect. So you feel them moving, you feel them, their eyes are opening or they're smiling. Mm -hmm. If you're so anxious that you can only sort of be like a wash where you're not really looking at people, you can't take that in. Now that right. takes practice. Yes. But it yes. is... It is about that. It is about a, a virtuous cycle that hopefully happens between you being present to yourself and then noticing your impact and then kind of getting in a flow with your audience. It's a relationship. Mm -hmm. And most Absolutely. of the time people are very frightened. And so it's hard to build that relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about business breakthroughs. Uh, because okay. that, of course, is what this podcast is all about. It's here to not only give uh, give coaches the skills that they need to have their next business breakthrough. But I really like to share, like have the guests share their business breakthroughs because they look so different. Every single person has had a business breakthrough of some sort and it looks different with everybody. So talk to me a little bit about a business breakthrough that you've had that you feel has kind of like changed uh, the way you look at your business, the way you're doing business, well, as I said, it's sort of a, it's sort of a full circle because I discovered I could teach online mm -hmm. and I, I still do, but this also meant spending all my communications and connections and output online. So with social media and, um, meeting people in the online space, which, which is real. I mean, it, that some of those connections are real world connections and I haven't met them, these people in person, which is kind of amazing. At the same time, it became really apparent to me that people are moving away from wanting to be online. Mm. Now there's a sense that we are, we've moved beyond the pandemic and things are opening up and there's a lot of momentum. And I realized, you know, in order to really get the level of clients that I need, the amount of clients that I want to work with, I really need to start making face-to-face -face connections. And Got it. But things have always happened most for me in my artistic life as well through relationships. Someone knows mm -hmm. me and they say, I really want you to play this role. It's not so much me going out, putting myself out exhaustively. It just sure. hasn't been that way. Whereas building relationships that then may bear fruit is really the way for me to go. So of course it has to be authentic. You're not just there. You're not just there to make sure that, you know, you get lots of work. You have to be, it has to be genuine. Absolutely. So I joined um, a local BNI chapter and it mm -hmm. happens to be a really, really great BNI chapter. And that's awesome. That's a uh, business networking international, which is the sort of the largest around the world, but you're meeting in, in small groups locally. 
Mm-hmm. And I've already found that that's really yielding results. And it feels like a much more nourishing place for me to put my energy. So I have one-to-ones with people during the week. Suddenly there's a community as well mm-hmm. as more potential for me to actually get clients through this particular engagement. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Because I think that we are so caught up in the online space and trying to market our businesses online, but it's so noisy. Exactly. There's so much going on online. It's really hard to get eyeballs on, on yourself. It just, it really is. And so I think that was brilliant for you to make that decision to join a networking group that puts you in front of people and has you starting to build relationships because that's the other thing with entrepreneurship, it can get lonely and doing, doing business online, even though you may meet people like we're meeting like this, it still can be very lonely. And when you get out into the community and start building those relationships, it feels less lonely. It feels like you have a community that's there to support you. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really does feel that way. And, and as I say, this particular chapter is tremendously warm and big hearted. So uh, that's, that's what just comes across. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Very cool. It is good. Yes. Okay. So let's start to dive into how we are going to transform our relationship with public speaking. One of the things that I know that you want to talk about, and I know that this is something that I am conscious of, and probably every person that is speaking is conscious of, and that is, how do I avoid using the word um, or any other filler word that comes into our vocabulary? Like, I don't know what people use and I'm super, as, even as I'm talking right now, I'm like thinking about, am I using um, am I using uh, am I doing something in that pause that is making it like kind of cringeworthy to, to listen to me? Well, so, I don't think you are. Oh, yay. <laughs> I don't think you are. Yay. Um, we, we don't always use um. I heard somebody the other day and it did not ruin, let's be clear, it depends how frequent it is, right? It doesn't ruin to occasionally say, um, Mm -hmm. it doesn't ruin to say like within a certain range, right? You don't want to be saying it all the time, but I was listening to somebody who was using, you know, in that way. Ah. So just to highlight that you may have an, um, that isn't an, um, you may have something you, you use frequently, this often is a sentence starter. And when I am on my podcast, I often cut, cut this out because I'll start by going, so la, 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 la. It's not terrible, but it's not the most powerful way to begin, right? <laughs> so there we are. So <laughs> you one of those words. Um is definitely the most distracting. Okay. And it happens when we're thinking of the next thing. So there's lots of places where I might have said, um, thus far in this interview. And what I do instead is I pause and I might breathe in the pause. And then I let my body do what helps me remember, which is my eyes might go over there. Very conscious of the things we do when our minds are working. That's okay. And then I take a breath. So Use the breath to substitute whatever your habit is and practice that. All of this requires starting to really observe and maybe even analyze yourself. So all the tips I'm going to give are about that. Yeah, I was just going to say that because I can imagine people saying, but how do I know if I'm saying, um, it's so natural or, you know, or so any of those things. How do you begin that process of awareness? Well, I'm sure there's a number of ways. It does have to do with tuning in. So the work that I do is starts with the body. So the work I do starts with the body and we start learning how to breathe. 
And the learning how to breathe portion of voice for speaking is quite meditative. So as soon as you become connected to your breath in the particular way that I would guide through, it's based on Linklater's voice work for actors, which is a globally recognized system for speakers specifically because actors are speakers, right? So it's that type of voice work. As soon as you start to come into the breath, you come into the present moment and you start noticing everything about your body. So for some people that can be, my God, I have all this pain. They're standing here, they're breathing, they're going, my God, my back hurts. Never noticed it previous, right? Because it sinks the mind into the body. So there are physical things we can do that sink the mind into the body and we start noticing. It can feel uncomfortable, but you have to know that it will get better. It will get better. So that's one way is the whole process of how we can learn Mm -hmm. to use our breath for speaking helps us to start observing. At the same time, you can also record yourself. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And you can record yourself. You can listen back. You can rehearse. There's a, there's a bit of a almost taboo around talking to yourself. Now, my mother was an only child, and so am I. So she talks to herself around the house. I'd be growing up, and I'd hear her muttering in another room. I do the same. (laughs) And so you have to get over feeling that there's something unhinged about doing that. We do it in our heads. I would just suggest start doing it aloud. So practice aloud. Practice improvising. If you're going to be in a more improvisatory presentation, which we frequently are, an interview, most of our speaking moments may be improvisatory in the sense that you you basically know what you're going to say. Practice that aloud. And do by all means, do it when no one's around, but practice it aloud and start noticing where you want to say, um, and then take it back. Say that thought again, inserting the breath. It's, it's really, in that sense, you can be very technical about it. Do you usually recommend that people practice in front of a mirror? No. No. Okay. It makes you very self-conscious. Okay. Although mirrors can be very helpful if you need to improve your articulation. Okay. But that would be in a scenario where you were working with someone like me. I do, I do do that. I work on clarity of speech and I'd have you be looking at my lips. It's very good on Zoom because look at my lips. Now look at your lips. Do you see how you're not moving them? Which is usually the case. Very, very still mouth happening. Then it's very useful to use a mirror. Got it. You can get too self-conscious. Mirrors, mirrors tell us a general issue. I'm going to give you an example because it's a really good one. So some people may have heard of the Alexander technique, which is to do with having a released neutral posture. And and it's used for performance. Actors often might do Alexander within their training. Okay. It also leads to being in a more released body. So there's a lot that it's good for. Alexander was an Australian opera singer and he was losing his voice. So he used the mirror to figure out why. What am I doing that's making me lose my voice? And it was that. So I don't know if you can hear. If you're listening and not watching this on video, I'm going to try it again. So as I tilt my head, can you hear what happens to my voice? Absolutely. Right? So he, start, he was looking up. He was raising his chin too high. It cuts off the space in the throat and the voice was being pressured to produce a huge amount of sound without actually having the freedom of the vocal cords. Very interesting. So mirrors can be really helpful, but don't live there. Okay. You might want to start there. So I take it back. Use the mirror selectively and then you want to be present in your body. Once you've seen what you do, try new things. And ideally have someone to help you, whether it be a group or a coach. It just makes all the difference because the mirror can make you watch yourself so much and feel so self-conscious. Self-conscious. You can't actually be free to express. A coach or or an outside eye of any kind, as an actor, I've experienced that as the director. I can be free because the director will tell me. 
Mm -hmm. I get to explore because they will tell me. If I'm watching myself, what comes off is, is rather stiff and self-conscious. Right. That makes sense. Totally makes sense. Yeah. We talked a little bit about the ums and how to eliminate that. I know from experience and I know from just, you know, knowing you that a lot of the relationship that we have with public speaking is very mental. And so you are going to share with us like five things to think about that will transform or begin that process, at least, of transforming your relationship with the public speaking experience. Can yes. Can we dive into that? Yes. So with, we've been speaking very technically, but these things are not separate. So I want to highlight that. I had a, a student tell me that I had once said to her, these are technical solutions to emotional problems. Mm. I totally forgot that I'd said that. But it really yeah, stuck with her. I love that. I yes. love that. Technical solutions yes. to emotional problems. Oh my gosh, I love that. So as we start to bring our voice forward, as we breathe deeply, a whole lot of feelings come up around it. As we start to articulate more clearly, we feel more confident. First, we feel awkward. Oh, it feels weird. But actually doing the gestures, the postures, the actions of confidence and being grounded creates a much greater sense of those things. Mm -hmm. So that's how the physical can impact your sense of yourself. But we don't want to, as you've pointed to, leave the psychology out. So we've talked about some of these things. So number one is know how to breathe. And then mm -hmm. we can take that further into this is going to help you with ums. It's also going to help you slow down. As soon as you insert a breath in the middle of the thought, your pace improves. Also, in English, we have this tendency to go up, you take that pause, and then you land the thought. So you, you suddenly become more lucid as well. So breath can set off this chain reaction if you know how to use it correctly. Mm -hmm. Breathe at the beginning of the thought and in the middle. And breathe through your mouth, which you will do naturally when you're speaking. But make sure you're not going, taking a deep breath, holding it and then speaking, you've lost your breath, or I'm taking a deep breath, I've let it out and then I speak, right? You have to take the deep breath and immediately speak. So it's kind of like you're breath, speaking breath. on the breath coming out. Is that right? Yes. Without breath, there's no voice. So you and I, Laurie, are naturally breathing through our mouth as we're speaking, once you're holding forth, you have to do that. To close the mouth, breathe through the nose, that's a whole extra step that is not natural to us. When we're speaking, we need more breath than normal because we need enough to live. I've got my breath for living. And then I'm adding, needing more breath because I'm also speaking. <clears throat> got it. Yeah, and I think that helps, I'm guessing, and you please correct me, when we breathe, it creates, like you said, the pause. And I, I've just heard, and please tell me if I'm wrong, I've heard that the pause in your speaking is very powerful. It allows your hearer's ear to catch up with your thought. Mm -hmm. So even there I said it allows, tiny pause, your hearer's ear to catch up with your thought. So when I'm talking about a pause, it may seem so small, you may not think of it as a pause. A catch breath is very fast, which I just did. Mm -hmm. But it just provides this lift in the thought, and then you will hopefully naturally land your idea. So it's really good for your audience as well. Awesome. Okay, cool. Okay, what else? Okay, so us? we talked about practicing. Practicing aloud is really important. You may or may not be surprised, depending on whether you're one of these people, about how many of my clients come to me and say they were going over their presentation in their head. Mm. So I liken this to being a, a musician. Say you're a flutist, flautist, mm -hmm. and you only practice the keys in front of the music. You only practice the keys and the only time you've blown into the instrument is in front of an audience. So when you think about it that way, you realize, oh my gosh, I have to speak. 
right. aloud with the volume I might want to be using. And that, that takes practice. So how loud do I need to be for space? That's something stage actors learn pretty young in our, in our experience because we're constantly, I toured a lot, meaning I was at different venues mm -hmm. and they were all different sizes. That teaches you so much. How loud do I need to be in this space? And you test it out ahead of time. So ideally test that out. Now, many of you may be on Zoom or in small rooms. So you're not going to need a lot of volume, but still activate your lips, really speak your words. That helps the voice come out. So are now, you recommending, yeah, so are you recommending, let's say someone is doing a presentation in a room and there's, you know, 25 to 100 people. Are you recommending that before that presentation starts that you go in and actually like test your voice? Kind of like you're testing ideally, like equipment. Ideally, you want to reach the back of the room and know that when there's people in there, they're really going to absorb the sound. Got so it. you Yeah, you want because to you reach we've all been room. in in rooms where you're maybe at the back of the room and the speaker is not speaking loud enough and you can't hear them. And, and if you feel you're struggling with volume, raise your voice and pitch slightly. That's the carrying tone for anyone, male or female. You, when we're in noise heavy environments and we're having to talk over, you can, you, you know that your voice can get tired after a night in a restaurant. Me too, because I'm not mm -hmm. thinking about my voice production. I'm just engaging. Right. But hopefully you can be more thoughtful in presentation. Know that to reach someone, you need to just lift the pitch and there it is. It's more piercing, right? Ah, I've just got I, I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not speaking in a terribly high voice, it's, but it's slightly higher than my natural speaking range. And you might have to do that for the entire piece if you're trying to reach people across the room. That's really interesting. I, I, it's so uh, subtle, but yet not. I mean, it's so obvious that you have raised like your your tone. Yeah, and 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 it and it carries a lot more. It carries because th this sound, these these pitches resonate off of the facial mask, so the the cheek resonance or the nose. You, I can feel it. It brings the voice forward. This is, so our head and our chest are our voice cavern or like a cathedral where you're bounce, you're actually bouncing sound. That is mm -hmm. not just a metaphor, it's, it's, it's literal. Wow, very cool. So understand what you do well. Here's where you've got to analyze. Also understand what you tend to rely on. Are you someone who presents a lot of facts? That's mm -hmm. great. Facts are an important part. Did you know that 75% of people fear public speaking? Think about how you can make those facts also into a question. If that's not something you do, do you ask questions of your audience, even though they're not going to answer you? So these are all different techniques you can think about under the umbrella of understanding what you do well and what you tend to generally do. Mm -hmm. Are you great with imagery if you're using presentations? Well, that's great. Make sure that you're really adding to that imagery, which you probably will be, right? Mm -hmm. Do you tend to list a lot of things, substitute that with imagery, and speak the content to your audience? So now we're really talking about presentations. But these are all things. Where do you tend to lean and how can you expand your range? So if you're great with facts, think about also using metaphor and telling a story in what you're sharing so that you're reaching the different types of learners in your presentation. So what do you do well? Or it could be my, I have a strong voice. Mm -hmm. it could be that. I know I have a strong voice, but I feel like I include too much information. How do I lessen that? Right. So yeah, understand what you do well. Think about things maybe other people do that you like. Can mm -hmm. I incorporate that? What can I do that's new? So I'm not just relying on the one thing I know I can do. Right. Um, and that actually incorporates number four, which is try something new. 
So add, add some skills to your repertoire that you've seen people do. Explore those and again, practice them. Mm -hmm. So that's not the first time in front of people. What would be like some, some skills that might be like one skill I can think of, and, and I want you to add to it if you can think of some, and I'm sure you can, but one skill to me that I think is really important in public speaking is the ability to tell a story. Yes. So if you have a lot of people listening to this, as I imagine you might, who are business owners themselves, mm -hmm. the origin story is a really key part of sharing who you are to clients or inspiring them with regard to your business. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a coach to have an important origin story. It can be anything that you're doing. You can be an insurance agent, sure, a broker. You're, you're going to have aspects of why you got there. So really, really look at why you're doing what you're doing. What's your story? Mm -hmm. Actually, next week in, in our time right now, I'm, I have a newsletter that's going out that's talking about how to share your story if you have some aspects of trauma, because powerful mm -hmm. origin stories often do have trauma in them. Mm -hmm. And so it can be frightening to share that. So I sort of outline how you would start just dipping your toe in and being quite general. So you're sharing the landscape of that mm -hmm. for the first time you do it, and then really aiming at how this helped you to triumph. Because this is a question that's come up with people before. I realized, yeah, there's a lot of people out there with some very painful, powerful stories. Yes. How do you share in business appropriately? Yes. So there's a way that you can do that where you just touch on it. I didn't mm -hmm. feel safe. I didn't feel physically safe as a child and therefore could be it. Right. You don't go into, you, you can start it, you there. You don't have to go into the, the gory details no. of actually what happened. No, and then if that felt good... And you're protecting yourself too in that situation, right? You're, you're not, you're protecting yourself from somehow being re-triggered by the audience being uncomfortable, et cetera, right. et cetera. You just touch on that. And then you say, so I vowed I would never feel that vulnerable again. And it led me to martial arts. And now I help people feel empowered in their body, right? Mm, that's okay. That's like, that's how you would do something like that. So now, of course, I'm talking specifically about trauma. But you can see that if you're in a short context, there's a great way that you can just say, underlying event that led me to this, here's now how I'm inspired because of that. It can be that short. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I do remember like looking at other speakers and, and wanting to be, it, here's the danger, I think. Sometimes we compare ourselves to other people and we, we see things in other people that we really like and we wish that we could be that way. And it's just not a natural part of who we are. And I'll give you an example. I look at some speakers that are so funny and they can really make people laugh and they can really like engage an audience with humor. That is not me. Like my spouse, even like <laughs> she'll, she'll tell me a joke and I start asking uh, questions and she's like, it's a joke. J O K E. <laughs> okay. It's a joke, Lori. <laughs> it's like humor is not like, it's just not one of my strengths. Although I look at that and I think, oh my gosh, I wish I could be so humorous and I could make people laugh. How do we find that balance between seeing something and other speakers that we like, but it being so far from maybe what we really are. You have to trust that what you bring is your superpower. Yes. You are that speaker. You're not meant to be. So we often fail when we try to do something that is just not us. And that's where self-knowing and self-analysis comes in. What do you bring? What is your what is your power? And I think for Lori, it's going to be a certain amount of grounded energy, structure, a real sense of being able to outline a pathway like you've done in this interview. Mm -hmm. So use, use that, show the pathway that you see. Well, you know, here's a challenge. And how do you work with that? And 
And so deep inquiry, investigation, very similar to me in that way. We've, mm -hmm. We have some similarities. So, so you can do that and then you can authentically lighten it up because you're not a heavy person. I don't experience you that way. Like I'm going to use you as an example. I already am. So I'm okay. <laughs> you, you smile and laugh quite frequently. So tell that story, say, I would love to make a joke right now, but here's what happens when jokes come across my radar. <laughs> and, then, and then, and then tell the story about your spouse. Right. 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 People will laugh. It doesn't mean you're, hilarious or that you're a big jokester, but it's, it's nice. Right. So, sure. so you may not think that you're good at jokes, but perhaps you have a self deprecating lightness that you can use. <laughs> in that, right. Yeah, sometimes my, like, even sometimes my spouse says like, you are so hilarious and you don't even know that you're funny. Like you don't even try to be funny, but just who you are is hilarious. <laughs> it's like, well, okay. I'm not sure if that's a compliment or what. You would tell a story like that. You'd say, well, here's this thing that happened. And I thought this, you know, it's like, I mean, I'm taking it way too far, Laurie, but like Don yes. Quixote, right? Where he was constantly, innocently going through life, but, but these things would happen to him, right? So mm -hmm. you might be able to be very funny in that way by describing. Sure. And you have the lens of your spouse. So she can tell you what she thinks is. Funny it's particularly not. funny. Right. So use the people around you. You know, humor is not always stand up. Humor can be <laughs> true. If you know humor is a big part of your life, but you're like, I'm not a person who cracks jokes. Think about how it, how it is in your life. Sure. Awesome. So I know you have one final tip to share with us. Well, this would really be, and again, we've talked about it. I kind of jumped the gun and included all these things. And I think okay. that's because as a holistic coach, I see how everything's connected. So it all ends up coming out together. Gauge your performance for the context. So we've talked about okay. space, size. Mm -hmm. That can also manifest on Zoom. So just to touch on how that could be on Zoom instead of in a big room, I have to reach you through the screen. There is a way in which I up my animation in front of the computer because that space requires just a little bit more. Video requires a certain animation. I have to reach you through the screen. So that's one example, like for the medium, gauge yourself for the medium. And again, if you don't know what that is, look at what people do well, see who mm -hmm. you think really does well in that medium. And then the other thing is really take in, and this comes into the psychological, which we haven't addressed so clearly. If you're anxious about something, figure out what may have to do with your past, your own critical voice. Oh, I always do this. I listen to what your thoughts are telling you mm -hmm. and see how you can reframe them. It requires a lot of self-compassion. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to also look at your past, but look at your present. Are you a woman presenting in front of a largely male audience? Well, look no further for why you might feel. I mean, you might not. You might not, right. but you might. Mm -hmm. Are you a black person and there's very few other people of color in the room, but you're sure. presenting to this largely white group? So, so just, you will know that. It's not like you wouldn't know that. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> if you were a black person in that situation, you're like, yeah, you don't need to tell me that. Right. But, but what I'm saying is I want to acknowledge that these are contexts that can be really difficult. So don't underestimate how that's playing out. And then what is going to make you feel more comfortable? Are you expecting to deliver something that you're just going to feel uncomfortable delivering it in that way, in that environment? What can you do to feel safer and therefore be more impactful in that environment. And those answers are, are your answers. Absolutely. Sure. But, you know, and, and are there allies you can call upon who are colleagues, such as if you're presenting, but there's going to be a bit more call and response where you're asking a question, set that up ahead of time. Say, can you answer this question? If no one pitches in, prepare the stage, not only for your audience, but for you set the scene and get the support you need before going in. So 
often when we're scared, we procrastinate. We go, oh, God, I don't want to deal. Oh, God, here I am. Mm -hmm. Try to do the opposite of that and go, why am I feeling this? How much of this is is my past? How much do I really need to worry about? How much of it is me in this context? Mm -hmm. What can I do to reach this audience and feel safe? What supports do I need? Got it. Awesome. So, wow, we had a lot of a uh, lot of good things that we uh, talked about today. Tell me uh, and the listeners, how can somebody work with you? And I know you have a free gift that you are offering our listeners. Tell tell us a little bit about that. Well, I can be found at sjharrisoncoach.com and there's lots of offerings on there in terms mm -hmm. of how to work with me. I offer a free 30 minute consult. So you can simply book that. And if by any chance the time zone makes that really difficult, just tell me I can't book any of these times on your calendar and we can mm -hmm. work it out. I also have a free webinar that you can access from my website. So if you go there, you'll see access free class. And mm -hmm. that's half an hour that goes through some of the things that I've talked about here, but it really simplifies it and breaks it down and you get to actually see it. So that could be really helpful for you as well. I am yeah. physically based in the San Francisco Bay area. So okay. if you are local or if you're the kind of person who can travel somewhere, I also offer a week long intensive one to one with me. So that can be a sort of a VIP package is something that is also possible that that sometimes people are able to do and would love to do. Awesome. And I can tell you just from personal experience, because I am on SJ's newsletter list, I can tell you she shares amazing tips on uh, public speaking and just everything that we've been talking about today. I really love her newsletter. So if, if anything, just go to her website and uh, subscribe to that and you're going to get a lot of goodness out of that. Oh, so you, I Lori. like to end the interview in a fun way. And I want to ask you, what is like a book, a podcast or a TV show that you are currently binging right now? Okay, I'm going to tell you something I just stopped binging because I'm not in okay. a current. It was Better Call Saul. What is it, it called? Okay, I'll say it in an American accent. Better Call Saul. Okay, yes, I've heard Better of Call that. Saul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was um it was some of the most incredible TV I've ever seen. And I really hadn't cool. seen Breaking Bad. It's Yeah, cuz it's, a, it's it, a, like a sequel to that, correct? Yeah. Time-wise it takes place in the middle. Kind of okay. in the middle of of Breaking Bad or sort of before and then it, it travels around in time, but the acting, the writing, the constant not knowing what was going to happen next. And it is in the end redemptive. It's also less dark than Breaking Bad. I'm, I'm struggling to watch Breaking Bad. <laughs> it's, 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 it's more on the lines of the ridiculous and it's, it's less dark. Got it. But it's still definitely dark humor, but it, the, the level of writing that's out there these days, because of how we have streaming services, it's transformed things from when I was growing up in terms of the quality of the work. Right. It's amazing. I watch a lot of foreign shows as well, mostly foreign, foreign language. Okay. Um, so I just saw something called Intimacy from Spain that's really powerful, very oh. feminist. Okay. Um, about a cool. mayor. Yeah, it's on Netflix, easy to find intimacy. And there's so much to watch. It's just like there's, there's so, so much, much TV yeah. out there. We're yeah. constantly looking for the next thing that uh, we are we are going to binge. And when I say binge, we binge. Like we literally like start a series at, at the beginning of uh, the weekend and we're like almost finished with it at the end of the weekend. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we watch every night when we get excited about something. Yeah, we watch yeah all I hear you. Seasons and just like kept going. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, SJ, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, all the expertise that you shared today. I hope that it helps listeners to um, 
improve their uh, public speaking or at least even go out and try public speaking as a way to land more clients because it truly, truly is one of the most beneficial ways to build a relationship with someone, have them experience who you are and your expertise and literally want them want to do business with you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was such a pleasure, Lori, to talk to you. Sure. That's a wrap on today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Boosting Business Breakthroughs podcast. Want to hear more business breakthrough ideas? I'll be back next week with a new episode to help you grow your coaching business. If you enjoyed listening, make sure you subscribe, leave us a rating, and tell all your coach friends where to find us. Head over to BoostingBusinessBreakthroughs.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. And remember, your next business breakthrough is waiting for you.